Recording is on. Cool. Um, so hi, everybody. Good evening. Today we have Darshana and Ruth with us, and they are going to present the talk on uh, just a second. Ludographic metafiction, metaverses and eco-criticism of F uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. And this is a talk held by Green Studies India Adda, and we are a bunch of students and professors and game developers and game enthusiasts. And we get together once in a while and we hold talks, podcasts, and sessions, etc. And we are super thrilled to have Darshan and Ruth today amongst us. And I'll I'll just give a short bio for both of them. Hold on. So Darshana Jayamani, I hope I'm saying it right, is a lecturer in art, media, computer ga and computer games at Abitur University and the author of Performativity in Art, Literature and Video Games. This book's title names many of his main research interests and develops a media studies approach to performance in digital space and time. He was co-investigator on the AHRC-funded Reality Remix project. His work has appeared in Games and Culture, the Journal of Broadcasting and Electronic Media, Fiber Culture Journal, and Westminster Papers in Communication and Culture. Recently, he has organized the Game Engines Beyond Games Symposium, along with Baby Castle's Gallery in NYC, and is convener of the Keywords in Play interview series about diverse games research. He was a jurist for the Excellence in Narrative Awards at the 20, uh, 2019 and 2020 Independent Games uh, Game Festival Awards. Ruth E.J. Booth is a multiple award-winning writer and academic of fantasy based in Glasgow, Scotland. Her poetry and fiction can be found in Black Static, Pseudopod, and The Dark Magazine, as well as anthologies from New Contrast and Fox Spirit Books. Winner of the BSFA Award for Best Short Fiction and, short, and shortlisted twice for the British Fantasy Award in the same category in 2018, she received an honorable mention for Ellen Datlow's Best Horror of the Year, Volume 10. In 2019, her quarterly column for Shoreline of Infinity, Noise and Sparks, received the British Fantasy Award for Best Nonfiction. Over to you, Darshana and Ruth. You guys, you guys can start the screen recording and start your presentation. Darshana, are you with us? Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll be yeah. Okie dokie. So, oops. Um, thanks to the organizers for um, inviting us today. As you can see, we're going to be talking about um, lithographic metafiction. It's a very sort of academic-y term that we came up with. Um, to describe something and in relation to uh, Final Fantasy VII and the remake. Um, so I'll do the first um, section of the talk, kind of like looking more at the theoretical um, kind of elements, and then I'll throw to Ruth to uh, talk about the close reading of Final Fantasy VII um, remake and how we kind of like see this, this idea working in that text. And um, so the the theoretical kind of like side of things, I still think is still a bit of a work in, in progress. So it's really great to be able to like share this with you um, and get some feedback on um, how we're sort of like thinking about it. If there's any stuff that we can add to um, to the the concept. Um, and uh, but I think we're pretty sure that um, it, it fits quite well for the case study that we've got here. But are we talking about some other possible um, examples as well? So um, Final Fantasy VII occupies a storied place in the gaming canon. 
Released in 1997 for the PlayStation, the game made use of the platform's CD format for an experience that was both highly extended, comprising three discs, and audio-visually impressive. So I think it's important, you know, as you can kind of like glean initially from that, that term ludographic, um, this is kind of like uh, paying close attention to, um, to play and to the conditions of play. And Final Fantasy VII in particular carries this, this, this huge kind of like ludographic freighting, you could say. Um, just, I mean, those of us of a particular vintage remember when it came out and it was, you know, an event. It was, I, I remember like kind of seeing it in so many different kind of like magazines, this kind of like this picture of this spiky head guy with the ludicrously large sword and just kind of like, it's kind of like what, what got me into playing consoles um, in the first place. And I think that that kind of story about Final Fantasy VII is, is quite common. Um, it was a bit of a kind of like a doorway onto, um, onto gaming as a whole for a lot of people. And, you know, the, the kind of unevenness of the text, the, the way that it did have those three discs and the, um, the differences between the pre-rendered cutscenes and the in-engine kind of like chibi characters as you're walking around uh, in the world, as opposed to the the more normally proportioned characters in the battle sequences, and the you know the mini games and all of this different stuff that's kind of like um, I was getting a bit of feedback. Um, you know that this this kind of like bit of a ramshackle experience, but quite enthralling uh, nonetheless. So. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the storyline of this game followed eco-terrorist group Avalanche as they recruit laconic mercenary Cloud Strife in order to fight back against the dastardly energy company Shinra. Uh, this company is creating power and profit by unsustainably drawing on the life stream, which is this kind of like energy which circulates through the planet uh, and sort of like is the, the life force of the planet. In their quest, Cloud and Avalanche discover a larger th threat even than Shinra, the super soldier Sephiroth, created by Shinra when they combined human cells with that of an ancient being called Genova, the calamity from the skies. Now, depending on how deep we get with the close reading of Final Fantasy VII, we might go more into detail in the relationship between Genova and Sephiroth, but the you know, the, the idea of the calamity from the skies, even though it's kind of like a meteor um, in this case, um, sort of uh, gives you a sense, I guess, of um, like the, the climate stakes or the sort of like um, the environmental eco-critical stakes of the game. Um, Final Fantasy VII Remake, which we'll move on to talk about, um, was released in 2020 and reprises what was the first disc of the original game taking place in the starting city of Midgar, Shinra's capital. From a gaming perspective, Remake answered commercial and design imperatives. The original game remains well-known and popular amongst gamers, subject to decades of hermeneutic, hermeneutic discussion and analysis on gaming forums, not least to the, due to the popularity of subsequent spin-off games such as Dirge of Cerberus and the CGI film Advent Children. However, it is difficult to play given uh, the original is difficult to play given the vintage platform and outmoded gameplay structures such as random encounters. The 2020 outing could have simply been the remake its title suggests, you know, improving graphics, gameplay, streaming oriented options, making the game appealing to a new generation of players while retaining most of the original plot and, um, and uh, other sort of like elements. However, the game also remakes its, uh, this is the uh, Final Fantasy VII remake. Um, it remakes its eco-fictional cyberpunk storyline through the introduction of these new characters, the Whispers, in a move we term ludographic metafiction. So it should be noted that Square Enix has a form in 
um, modifying and combining and um, kind of mixing, remixing its games. So this game series, Final Fantasy Dissidia, it draws together the characters from across um, like numerous Final Fantasy games. I think you know, I'm not an expert on this, but the um, the Final Fantasy fourteen or the um, the the massively multiplayer game that I think they had a, a a launch that didn't go so well, so they made another one called A Realm Reborn. So they they're, they're very kind of like uh, you know attuned to their own back catalog, and um, it's part of their kind of like. Um, their experience, which is doing this sort of work of combining different sort of texts. So what is this, uh, where do we get this term ludographic metafiction? Um, in kind of like coming up with this, we're drawing on Linda Hutchins' classic work, work on postmodern fiction uh, and her notion of historiographic metafiction. So you've got some quotes there from the kind of like landmark paper that she, um, uh, or Lama publication. So historiographic metafiction for Hutchin is a strategy by which postmodern literary works engage with historical archives while also problematizing the textuality of those archives through self-reflexive techniques. Many of the postmodernist techniques Hutchin notes have playful connotations, irony, humor, parody. These tend to um, kind of uh, contribute to postmodernism's notorious flattening of hierarchies. So you can see in the quotes there um, that historiographic metafiction uses these, um, these paradoxical tropes in order to um, engage with the textual nature of our access to the past. So uh, these authors and most of the authors that she discusses um, are kind of like American postmodernist authors like um, Doctoro and um, um, Ishmael Reed. Um, and these authors, by drawing on the historical archive as a text, um, perform this double operation where they're both um, calling to question the past by saying that texts are our only access to the past, but also underlining its importance. So that duality of um, historiographic metafiction is really, really key, and that that paradoxical kind of nature of it. Um, one of the um, kind of like key links with the uh, context of video games um, might be the kind of like use or the what's been often noted by commentators on play. Uh, the, the paradoxical kind of activity of play. Um, so this is drawing on Gregory Bateson's theory of play and fantasy, where he discusses why um, the nip and the bite. So the playful nip is you, you're like he describes going to a zoo and um, observing that animals, like the baby animals, um, play fighting with each other. And he says, you know, it really looks like. An, an, an earnest bite, yeah. like this is, you know, these animals are biting each other, but they must know, given the, the way that they interact with each other, that there's this kind of like level of meta communication to the nip um, that conveys this message, this is play. So again, because you've got two levels going on there where the nip resembles the bite, but is not a bite, that is paradoxical as well. So I'm not, you know, when I put my name there as well, I'm not comparing myself to Gregory Bateson, but I'm just saying that this is from um, a part of uh, my book where I talk through these sorts of paradoxical issues. Um, and so you can see that there's there's some mapping that can be done there between Hutchins' use of paradox, irony, humor, parody uh, in literary texts and how they interface with the historical record and the way that play also works through its, um, uh, its interfaces um, to, to generate new experiences. So as, as we were kind of like researching, um, the, uh, provenance of Hutchins idea and in 2002, she actually argued 
that digital media have, and this is a quote, transformed the language you use and the social world in which we live. And at that point, she was um, calling for new metafictional heuristics, so new ways of thinking about how um, uh, things have changed since the more sort of like literary textual um, analysis that she was doing. And even then, she was already noting that a lot of these um, postmodernist texts, they actually can like contain engagements with the medium specificity of uh, other media like cinema, like, um, you know, radio. You think of Thomas Pinchon and um, the way he works with like kind of engineering um, and um, all sorts of different discourses. So we came across this really uh, promising um, kind of idea uh, from Bruno Bueno um, called Geek Metafiction. Nerds, Footnotes and Intertextuality is the, the text uh, where he talks about this. And he's examining um, uh, Juno Diaz's uh, Oscar Wow uh, novel, which incorporates a, ho a whole lot of like kind of um, uh, sort of like geeky knowledges. It features like major, it features geek characters as the, the protagonists essentially. And they're always talking about comic books and um I mean, it occurred to me that um, certain elements of Roberto Bolaño, like 2666, that kind of work could also be, um, uh, you know, sort of answer to some of these ideas. But we kind of found after kind of like going through this that the idea of geek metafiction refers to the use of these playful, um, paradoxical kind of like uh, sort of techniques to incorporate within the literary field and the sort of like the field of high literary art, um, the sort of like the comic books and, the, and it's interesting that Bueno notes that um, video games don't really appear very much in this novel. It's mostly comics and sort of sci-fi um, that kind of like give it its kind of like textuality. But this is, so geek metafiction is almost the inverse of what we're, we're talking about with ludographic metafiction, where geek metafiction refers to incorporation of, of geeky, geeky subject matter into the uh, literary text. Ludographic metafiction more refers to knitting together of ludic texts out and, and pushing out so that they start to, um, you know, kind of in a really fecund sort of a way, start to interact with texts beyond the gaming field. So rather than kind of like bring them into the literary field, Ludographic metafiction is how they sort of like knit together in a, a much more patchwork kind of a way. So examples maybe of, of some of the things we were thinking about. Um, I don't know if uh, how many people recognize this guy. This is my favorite uh, Street Fighter character, Dan Hibiki. Um, so this character uh, is pretty amazing. Um, he's Capcom's um, answer to SNK, um, who were basically, they created a whole lot of like Shoto fighters and put them into their games. And Capcom, who, you know, came up with Ryu and uh, Ken, um, maybe they talked to their lawyers and there wasn't enough uh, to go in there for some kind of legal action, but they came up with this, uh, this character who borrows all sorts of like trays from um, from, you know, this, this just kind of like a uh, huge roster of characters that that's being referenced here, but it's definitely a kind of like, uh, poking fun at their, their rivals. Um, the way that you read this character is basically via, um, this ludographic kind of, uh, background. He just, he only makes sense really, if you read him through thinking back to all of the references, all the game references that he, um, he embodies. And there's, you know, fighting games are a really good example here because, you know, you need it, the, the way that their narratives work. And people say that they're not really about narrative, but there's so much narrative that's produced around them because every character needs to have a story that happens if they happen to win the tournament. So you have all these counterfactual kind of like branching kind of like narratives um, that's uh, really kind of like um, productive.
Uh, another 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 fave. Um, this is God Hand uh, for anyone who is familiar with again somewhat more vintage gaming. <laughs> but as you can see here, uh, this is another Capcom kind of effort. Um, there's it's it's just incredibly intertextual. It's so uh, it's just throwing throwing citations at you nonstop. So Fist of the North Star. Um, the kind of like space invaders, um, the final levels of this game are set in a tower ascent where you're climbing up the tower, which kind of like references Bruce Lee's final movie, Game of Death. Um, and, you know, Americana, there's, you go to Venice for some reason. It's just kind of like nonstop. And one of the things that you can kind of see here is that one of the other things they cite are directly game mechanics, game rules. So they will kind of like... Uh, you know, and, and the game has like over 106 moves, I think I remember. So this again is like ludographic metafiction where to get the full understanding of it, you're kind of like incorporating this, kind. you're, you're doing this ludographic kind of like background work to understand it. I won't spend too much longer on um, all these uh, sort of examples, but obviously, you know, um, it's, been common in the, the Mortal Kombat series. So you might recognize like, three of these characters, I think, are from Mortal Kombat kind of like canon. But the Terminator, Joker, and Spawn, they're just like they're from another universe. And this is one of the characteristics of ludographic metafiction, which it draws on science fiction and fantasy tropes to justify these kinds of like crossing overs. And it doesn't need to be particularly highfalutin, as you can probably tell by now. These, it's a way of kind of justifying the ramshackle kind of um, nature of some of this narrative work that there's no real reason apart from the Terminator. You get to see the Terminator beating up Spawn. Like that's that's kind of like what's going on here. Although they do have like narrative kind of structures to it. Um, one of the most interesting sort of things that Hutchin uh, points out um, in her original kind of uh, piece is that in addition to some of the, you know, the, the famous white male um, novelists um, that get discussed in postmodernism, you know, the postmodern canon a lot, it's actually uh, also, you know, these, these paradoxical kind of like historiographic metafictional techniques have been used by authors like Ishmael Reed um, and uh, feminist authors as well to question like power hierarchies um, you know, in this kind of like playful way, but with a, a deep vein of seriousness under, underneath what's going on. Um, I haven't really thought about this enough, so I'd be interested to see what other people think. Um, and the so, sort of some seminal indie games like um, Depression Quest or um, Dysphoria, which you see here, you think about the kind of like the bait and switch um, in Gone Home, uh, the, the, the genre kind of like change. <coughs> Um, and yeah, as I said, I need to, probably need to think about this a little bit more, but the um, idea of ludographic metafiction, uh, you know, this citation of game rules and um, using them for other purposes, um, there may be something to draw from Hutchin in, in, in that regard as well. So here's a rundown of some of the things from the, that we're, we're trying to hone in on. Um, with regards to this concept. So drawing on Hutchin, you know, this tendency to self-reflective parodic, parodic or ironic form, citation of game mechanics, um, common use of science fiction and fantasy tropes. Uh, Ruth and I actually presented uh, a version of this at the uh, International Conference for the Fantastic in the Arts. Um, so that was really interesting to see what the fantasy scholars uh, thought. Um, Interdiscursivity, uh, that's Hutchins' kind of idea about um, needing to expand beyond just the textual relations. Um, privileging character over plots. So like I said, these, these plots can be very, uh, very messy. That's not necessarily a problem for ludographic metafiction um, because, you know, I mean, one of the other things is that you need to preserve to some degree the ability of the characters to go back to their original universes. And that kind of leads to the next. Uh, so they, they don't tend to learn much in these adventures. They don't have like plot arcs or like kind of character beats necessarily, which change them deeply as characters. 
a lot of the time. Um, and that kind of like feeds into the legal and commercial responsiveness that is often necessary for these. And that is a big, big kind of like shift maybe from uh, some of the, um, you know, the, the, the postmodern authors where they could go to the historical archive and use metaphysical te met metafictional techniques um, to engage with those and play up the the text the, the mutual textuality but with games obviously the, the 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 productive kind of like forces are very different um this is the bit where i definitely haven't done enough work yet so orientation to transformational fiction fandom studies and transmedia studies i'll just move on because I, I i need to do more work to to, to build that out um although maybe uh, some of you will have some advice of good stuff to read I've got an idea, but yeah. Um, and then this is another one that's quite a big change. So the incorporation of social elements, if you, you know, a lot of the kind of like uh, contemporary concerns around games have to do with this, this dovetailing of game design techniques, which are very, you know, based often based on very powerful psychological um, insights, um, along with the reach and kind of like need for user attention of, uh, social media. Um, so maybe talk a bit more about that down the track. Um, and potentially, um, you know, as we go further, but you can all already think of like Pokemon Go, um, IoT and mixed reality kind of techniques. So that's kind of like um, the cheat sheet. Um, for ludographic metafiction. And what's the kind of like the key, well, the most influential um, kind of like contemporary manifestation of this is probably Fortnite. I mean, the magnitude of the commercial concerns that are involved here is very significant. And, um, you know, you can see a lot of the kind of like processes that we're trying to describe um, at work in Fortnite, having guest kind of like stars from Star Wars, from uh, from Avengers, from The Walking Dead and Alien, they've just got like so many, but they're all kind of like transformed in this engagement, in this ludographic kind of like, like get, becoming playful affects certain kind of like transformations on these characters. And these processes are affecting our world, our real world, at the highest levels. So I don't know if uh, those of you who have seen um, the Fortnite, uh, the, the free Fortnite hashtag um, and the 1980 Fortnite um, kind of ad that they did, which was conducted inside Fortnite itself um, and had a whole social media, so, so um, epic, they know how to do this, that every time that like when they um, kind of have events like this, they, this was all pre-planned. Um, all the strategy across the board was pre-planned. They obviously had that video ready to go, parodying Apple's, um, you know, original video, which was targeting IBM. And this is kind of like part of, um, so the CEO of um, Epic actually name-checked Neil Stevens's um, Snow Crash um, in this antitrust suit that is that um, they launched they've launched against Apple um, so you know without going into too much detail about the legalities of this and how things have uh, you know the arguments that have been made this is ludographic metafiction where they're using the techniques of gaming to incorporate um, Apple's original commercial and this is part of the overall um, drive to you know develop a metaverse in which all of the diff different fictional characters can coexist and not just that they want this to be um you know a space in which all sorts of activities can occur now this should as critical theorists this should get our um you know critical um uh you know minds going when the CEO of Epic says something like the metaverse, singular, that's kind of like, you know, as we know from as observing um, close observers of, of, of this industry, 
that's the, the glitzy kind of like very attractive um, surface image of these multi massively multiplayer worlds, um, technical marvels, but they are built on foundations of um, pretty messed up sometimes labor um, relations. And, uh, you know, they are commons that are created with a view to, to enclosure and exploitation um, in various ways. So monetization and uh, those sorts of techniques. So, you know, this, this ludographic metafiction being part of this um, antitrust suit, part of the overall strategy is, I think, pretty significant. Okay, so we'll now move towards the, um, the specific case study, which is Final Fantasy VII. Um, and I kind of want to, yeah, I might, I might skip over, over this so we can get to Final Fantasy VII faster. But I do want to mention, now that I can actually talk about this game, um, Umarangi Generation, uh, which is a, a 2020 game. Uh, it did really well at the um, Independent Game Festival and um, has won a bunch of other awards. And the way that this game works, as you can kind of tell, um, has a very, very jet set radio um, kind of look to it. It does its own kind of ludographic metafiction that is just so distinctive from what you'll be talking about with a Fortnite or even a Final Fantasy VII. So it's created by Maori developer Naftali Faulkner, who currently lives in Australia, and it takes place in a mid-apocalyptic Taronga. The cityscape is oppressive, and young people's street culture pushes back against an overbearing state. Players take on the role of a photojournalist who records image packages for the Taronga Express. Using a DSLR, players snapshots of various levels. This is another one that you, that kind of like subverts the FPS with a camera rather than a gun. Um, so, you know, you take these digital shots of various levels, apply filters and move sliders to adjust the image. Um, and then you get paid to upgrade your equipment. So it's a fairly, fairly normal kind of like gameplay loop, loop in that respect. But as you play, things get very, very strange. Umurangi means red sky in the Tereo language. And Faulkner has linked the game's development, which occurred pretty rapidly over 2020, um, given how sophisticated it is, um, to the Australian government's inadequate response to the bushfires of that year. As the game progresses, environmental clues hint at the reasons behind the state's repressive activities, as it becomes clear that Taronga is one of the last bastions of resistance against an alien invasion. Um, so in referencing Jet Set Radio through the street culture, through the relation of like punk aesthetics and hip hop and uh, drum and bass um, in the soundtrack to this youth culture of freedom, um, Umurangi Generation does ludographic work to distinguish itself. This, and I, I, I won't say too much about, um, about um, the overall kind of like message here, but this game really relies on that, um, that contradistinction to set itself apart. It's a very much more bleak and angry kind of uh, world than, than Jet Set Radio. But I think that, you know, and there's no possibility of heroically averting this apocalypse only to document the world's final days. Um, so, with that upbeat, um, let's uh, let's turn to Final Fantasy VII and its version of eco criticism. So, uh, Ruth, if you want to take it away, I'll advance the slides when, and just let me know if you need me to. Will do. Thanks very much, Darshana. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Excellent. Okay. Um, I'll try and keep this to about 15, 20 minutes. Um, if I go too fast, just leave a note in the chat and I'll see it. Um, okay. So I'm going to 
as, as Darshana um, helpfully explained um, all the theory, I'm going to be dealing with the analysis, but I want to kick off with a paragraph from the um, ICFA talk that we gave um, a couple of months ago, I think it was now. Um, so ludographic metafiction answers Hutchian's call for new metafictional heuristics by identifying digital games use of fantastic tropes to engage with gaming history as well as the specific modes of intertextuality it has fostered. The task of ludographic metafiction is therefore to create a frame for fantastic crossings but one that includes the medium specificity of video games, gamer argo, so language, behavior, interactions, um, hardware standards, cultural debates, and so on. So mapping ludofictional self-reflexive entanglements becomes part of the game, a sop for experienced players and an invitation to media historical work for novitiates. Um, I just want to point out that a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about in this analysis sounds a lot like common sense to a lot of us kind of reading this who are aware of the stories of Final Fantasy, but it's worth pointing out that what we're actually doing when we interact with these games and how we read them is quite a complicated process. And it's kind of interesting the things that we can draw out of these games and the messages and the themes that we can kind of be thinking about um, through these games. So um, here we're using the specific example of, um, as Darshana said, uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake from 2020, which is an update of the original game. So spoilers incoming. Um, in this game, the, the new characters, the metafictional whispers, rework the formerly anthropocentric eco-critical themes and the ludography of the original game through the player's identification with not only the player characters and their stakes in the planet's survival, but also with the planet itself. Um, now, if we have any Final Fantasy fans here, I just want to point out we won't be covering the recent DLC intermission, um, but if there are any people who've played that here, then we'd welcome any comments about that afterwards. So um, next slide, please. So these are the whispers, uh, the Dementor looking boys. Um, in Final Fantasy VII Remake, the planet acts through the whispers. These are spectral uh, hooded figures who selectively appear to characters in the game at significant points in the story. Um, now, player character Red 13 later reveals that the whispers are um, arbiters of fate with fate being specified as the will of the planet itself. And um, this is a departure from the original Final Fantasy VII where the planet had no voice of its own and instead there were many groups who thought of what was best, who, who spoke for it essentially, or what they thought was best for it. So here you can see several of them here. Um, so we've got, as Darshana mentioned, the eco-terrorist avalanche of which uh, player characters Barrett in the brown jacket and Tifa in the uh, white and black. Um, they, they're members um, who recruit the other two, uh, the other three, sorry. Um, then we have player character Aerith in the red jacket there, um, who is the last descendant of this ancient race called the Setra. Um, and they have a, a special connection to the planet, so they can, they can speak for the planet. And then we even have main antagonist Sephiroth standing here very menacingly at one side with his silver hair. Um, and he claims inheritance of the planet and therefore he knows what is best for it. Unfortunately, what he thinks is best for it is to bring about the apocalypse. Um, in the remake, nature is no longer this passive entity to be saved by all these characters, though. Um, but through the whispers, it's this active participant in the narrative who can speak for itself. Now, on a metafictional level, this actually reflects changes in eco-critical climate change discourse since the original game. Um, many scientists believe it's no longer possible for us to put a complete halt to climate change. 
because we've entered the Anthropocene. So uh, we, the planet has changed irrevocably. It's reacting to the changes that we have caused. And rather than a case of us saving the planet, reverting it back to its original state, um, our aim with climate change action is to mitigate climate change, to try not to make things worse. And as we'll come to see, that's much as how the player characters in Final Fantasy VII Remake now have to mitigate the actions of the Whispers. So next slide, please. Um, so since the goals of the Whispers sort of roughly align with those of the player characters in um, in Avalanche, the eco-terrorist group, we would kind of expect them to be allies, right? They'd work together, they'd have the same goals, but that's that's not the case in the game. The whispers interfere in gameplay to the point where their motivations are initially inscrutable to us as players. Um, so they'll assist the players in getting the characters Cloud and Aerith to escape from the old church when they're attacked by Reno. Um, and the Whispers will create this path that they can follow and, and they'll block Reno from catching up to them so they can escape. Um, but here in the scene that's shown on screen right now, that is a clip from the additional fight that the Whispers create um, in front of the bar Seventh Heaven, which occurs prior to the attack on Mako Reactor 5. Now, um, you could see a positive side to this fight. It allows um, the player character Cloud to join the attack on Mako Reactor 5. But the reason why he is, is because the Whispers actually injure non-player character Jesse, um, whose bomb making skill is actually vital to Avalanche's mission. So, you know, as to whether they're a net good in that particular case, it's rather ambiguous. Um, but the impact of the whispers creates tension for players who are familiar with narrative patterns found in other games. The, um, so you probably all be familiar with the whole idea of save the world, get the girl type of narrative. Um, as early as, say, the Super Mario Brothers series, where, um, where Mario has to go and rescue Princess Peach, the fate of the world is contingent on him doing that, and um, as long as he rescues her, everything will be wonderful and fine with the world again. Um, but in Final Fantasy VII Remake, the players are actually encouraged to question the whole idea of aiming to save the world. Um, the actions of the Whispers have tragic consequences. Um, they cause the deaths of fan favourites Wedge and Jesse, and the power of the players to mitigate these effects is quite limited. I mean, they can, they can fight the Whispers, or they could find alternative routes through Midgar to avoid them, but they can't prevent these deaths from happening. Much as with the planet's response to global warming, the players can mitigate the effects of climate change, but not prevent climate change from happening. Um, in many situations, the Whispers are actively working against the player according to their own will. Or are they? Next slide, please. So um, here we come to the second metafictional resonance of the game, which is the will of gamers of the players themselves. Um, as the story progresses, we learn that the will of the planet as enacted by the Whispers is to preserve the events of the original game. So they want everything to happen as it did in the original version. So um, here we see that when Sephiroth murders Barrett in the Shinra Corporation offices, offices the uh, Whispers actually revive Barrett from death because, um, as Red 13 says here, this death is not the one ordained for you by fate. Barrett did not die here in the original game, so the Whispers have saved him. Um, the Whispers here are actually serving as a metafictional commentary on games culture because, um, as many of you may know, game, gamers expect to have a certain amount of influence these days on gaming studio output. The actions of the Whispers in the game anticipate the reactions of long-term fans of the series to changes to the game. Many of them were disappointed that, the, that this so-called remake didn't simply follow the story of the original game. 
So identifying with the whiz, whiz and identifying with the players creates conflict in these players. Um, and this conflict is particularly tense um, considering that the original narrative, the one that players actually want, eventually leads to the death of another beloved player character, Aerith. Um, so if we switch to the next slide now, actually, that might be a good idea. Thank you. Um, so Aerith actually seems aware at some points in the story that she's a video game character, or at least that she's part of this wider narrative that she doesn't have that much control over. Um, when the player takes control of Aerith during a battle, her dialogue includes lines that sound like she might be addressing the player, including words such as, so it's my turn, don't worry, I can handle this, and I'll show you what I can do. Now, um, here we're seeing um, a still from a cutscene. If the player chooses to make player character Cloud um, begin to romance Aerith, the player is given this cutscene where Air, at one point Aerith turns, faces the camera and says, but whatever happens, you can't fall in love with me. Now, although the dialogue at this point is addressed to Cloud, um, in context, um, we can read this as a plea to the player from a player character, a, play, a character who accepts that, that she, is, she is going to die, that it's the will of the whispers, it's the will of the planet, and she doesn't want us to feel bad about that. But that creates even more conflict within players when, when they realise that, that the whispers are supposed to be them. So, but additionally, this conflict, as well as developing the fan culture metafiction of the game, it also develops the eco-critical message. Um, when the original game created um, player empathy with the fate of the planet through Barrett's ability to hear the planet's pain, in Remake, designating the players as planet through identification with the whispers forces players to take a more direct, non-anthropocentric view on climate change issues. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, at the end of the original Final Fantasy VII, 500 years on from the climax, the human race is strongly implied to have died out. And we see a scene very much like this one with Red Thirteen um, and his children um rushing through this world that that no longer has humans in it um but a glimpse of this cutscene is given in a vision to cloud towards the end of the game which suggests that the planet's desires are for the same extinction of the human race um which again creates some additional conflict because it pits saving the girl or in this case saving the human race against saving the world. Players are forced to re-examine their attitude towards climate change and the original narratives kind of simultaneously. Um, the sacrifices of beloved characters, the end of humanity, the original outcome of the game are what's best for players and what's best for the planet. But is that a sacrifice we should be really making? Um, next slide, please. So this conflict comes to a head in the final battle with Sephiroth. Notably, Sep Sephiroth can defy the whispers. He slices a gap in, um, in this mass of whispers to access another dimension out of time, which symbolizes his disregard for and immunity to the planet's will, um, as represented by the whispers. Um, but the players can do this as well. Aerith cuts her own doorway through the, through the whispers um, into this same dimension. And the parallel is clear. Us as players, um, or at least the player characters, do not have to save the planet at the cost of their lives. Um, indeed, they have the option to, like Sephiroth, defy the planet and go and destroy it, um, much as we, as people, have the option to carry on as usual, ignore climate change, let the planet die. Um, indeed, Sephiroth even tries to get Cloud to join his side, which is, you know, and bring about the apocalypse, which is quite interesting. But the players, the player characters fight for survival is framed as both against 
the planet's will and against Sephiroth's apocalyptic goals in this scene. But ultimately, they choose neither path in the final confrontation. They defeat both the Whispers and Sephiroth, but they are still determined not only to save the planet, but its people as well. Um, so this encourages players to regard climate change as not simply a choice between um, us as human beings and the planet, but that there's a middle way worth fighting for. Um, next slide, please. Um, ultimately, the game offers no clear answers as to the righteousness of this path and even indicates the existence of more alternative timelines through the return of player character Zack. The rain that falls at the end of the game symbolises the potential for healing in this new timeline. But Aerith remarks that she misses the steel sky of Midgar and the security it represents. For now, the ultimate eco-critical message of Final Fantasy VII Remake is that for us and the planet to survive the Anthropocene, we need to step away from the comfort of old narratives around possible climate change futures and begin to write our own. Um, as, as, as you're aware um, from, the, from the fact there is a DLC, uh, this game is only a partial adaptation of the original, uh, but the unknown journey continues in promised future installments, um, which gives us the opportunity to examine, um, examine the developing lithographic metafiction of the series as it unfolds, as well as develop our own theory. As Final Fantasy VII Remake demonstrates, digital games and virtual worlds are becoming more entangled with culture and society, which is leading to new logographies, new metafictions, but it also allows games like Final Fantasy VII Remake to provide nuanced explorations of multiple debates within society at the same time, whether these are over um, environmental issues or fan culture and embed themselves within these discussions more clearly um, and more closely through its use of lithographic metafiction to reorient its critical eco-critical themes remake presages ever expanding connections between the lyric the fictional and the real thank you very much Thank you, Darshana, and thank you, Felix, for the wonderful presentation. So freaking fantastic. Uh, the, the, the chat box is going, uh, there's, there's so much uh, conversation going on there. Uh, should we move to the question and answer session now? Yeah. Um, I'll just, should I stop sharing my screen or leave that up? <clears throat> um, it's okay. You can leave it on. Uh, you could switch it up, whichever okay. works for you. Uh, by the way, in, in case any of you want to ask your question directly, just unmute and ask your question or give your comments. But we can move to. Well, there's a lot of. Uh, just give me a second. I think there's a lot of conversation. I don't see the, uh, the questions as such. Or if Vitra, would you like to ask a question, please? Or make your comments, whatever. Oh, Lakshmi wants to go. All right, Lakshmi, then she's. Hi, guys. Um, so uh, lovely. It's a really great talk because I think eco criticism and Final Fantasy have been something that I've been thinking about ever since uh, I played this game. And um, I also really love that the, the, this idea that you've brought up because I mentioned earlier, I think it's a great way to look at other um, franchises like you mentioned. And I was thinking about the Kingdom Hearts franchise also helmed by Tetsuya Nomura and how much he loves to bring uh, all of this together in like one jumble of characters and storylines. Um, with regards to FF7 Remake, a couple of things I wanted to uh, hear your opinions on is first how they kind of murder uh, the pre the idea of predestination when you fight the um, whispers at the end of the game and you know what uh, you know what narrative purpose you think i mean we don't know because nomura's mind works in mysterious ways uh, but you know what you think it might uh, mean on a metafictional level and also the whole um, other side of the story where uh, it's revealed at the end that zack's uh, story is continuing and this is something that's there at the end of the dlc as well 
uh, there's a, sec a special cut scene at the end where uh, you kind of see that uh, Zach has arrived at Eret's church, and in his timeline, Eret is dead. So, you know, I, I'm wondering how this would, you know, this plays into this larger idea of uh, metafictionality and, you know, what uh, the idea of playing with player expectations, maybe. Like, if Aerith is pre dead in that version, then will she not die in this version? Which is probably the thing that everybody wants to know uh, going forward into the games. Um, I think Darshana is best place to talk about Zach. Um, better place to talk about Zach than I am. So maybe if I talk about the whole idea of murdering predestination, um, and then you handle that side of it. Go yeah, for it. Cool. Okay. Um, murdering predestination. What a wonderful phrase. <laughs> I love that. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, um, what they've done is what they've done with the entire structure of the game by, by pitting the whole idea of just remaking remaking the original as being against the player's best interest is a really really clever way of looking at it um and sets up a really interesting um really interesting question for players at the end of the game um when they get to the bridge out of midgar and it's broken and they have to decide i mean it's not really much of a choice for the player because your only choice is really to either stop playing the game at this point or go on um murder predestination um you know have the fight with sephiroth and then go into the following part of the game but it does genuinely set up this there there's that um the slide that i chose actually darshana do you want to go back to that slide um yeah that, that that one yeah if we succeed if we win we'll be changing ourselves and this was a very difficult question for a lot of players to to be kind of thinking about because um for them to go on and to be continuing to play this game is is kind of accepting that it's not the same game and what might happen could be completely different and kind of taking them outside of their comfort zones and i think that there's um there's a wider um fan culture issue around this um that i could talk about at length with regards to um, how we regard um, how we regard fan texts and our love of them, and um, how we interact with them, whether we want them to always stay the same to preserve a specific world, or whether we want to grow with them to change our understandings with them or whether we want to remain within the specific sphere and that's actually the focus of my um of my phd project so i have a tendency to read it very much in terms of 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 fan culture do we want to uh, not just fan culture but personal development do we want to remain the same or do we want to continue to grow and interact and um to accept the fact that things have changed to take what we have learned from the game um out a little bit wider or do we want to stick within the same sphere and risk kind of stagnating um there is absolutely a lot of um reference to multi-branch narratives in game essentially that's a that's a skimming the surface of a very very long answer um but if you follow me on Twitter, then maybe at some point you'll get to see you'll get to see my um, my full um, PhD essay section on that. But yeah, this is this is a core part of my um, my PhD thoughts. So thank you very much for that question. Uh, thank you so much, Lakshmi, for that wonderful question, and thank you, Ruth, for answering that so amazingly. Uh, I think next we have Oritro. Oritro, can you go next? Do you want to go next? Hey. All right, so Oritro is connecting his mic. Darshana, do you want to say a little bit about Zach while Oritro is uh, setting up? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I was just gonna say that because <clears throat> I haven't. What's what's the game where he's the main character? Crisis Core or something? Um, oh. I haven't played. Yeah, that. Crisis Core. Um, yeah, but he's already a paradoxical character, right? Because he's Cloud in some ways, or the precursor of Cloud is. He like prefigures the the main player player character um, in this mirroring kind of like um, you could almost like psychoanalytically kind of read their doppelganger kind of relationship. Um, so I think that kind of like um, is really interesting in that regard. Um, and just to say, I tried to understand Kingdom Hearts at one stage, but the sheer amount of ludographical work i would need to do to even begin to understand it just like threw me off so i think it's it's important to be like it's not it, like may seem easy to us to understand these things but there's non-trivial amounts of work to unexpectedly quote espinosa um involved in that uh, um that kind of stuff oh we just had a bit of feedback there that's that's better now um yeah i, I think the, the the sheer amount of like kind of labor that's involved so these kind of like you know when, when, when we say it's a sop to to fan culture and this is why I need, we need to do maybe a bit more work on current scholarship in that area um you know the, the the sheer kind of like volume of some of these wikis and you know fan fiction kind of like creations and stuff like that um just kind of like uh shows the um prevalence of ludography i guess like you know scholars sometimes have ludographies at the end of their articles um but scholarship is only a narrow slice of the overall sort of like ludographic kind of activity that's that's out there um yeah so that's how i would answer that we we wait and see for the next for the next section i think to see what happens with zach um hello uh, am I yeah I'm sure. uh, okay so great talk. I love the talk, love the session. And uh, Final Fantasy VII has uh, been one of my favorite games. So I was very looking forward to this talk. Uh, first, a comment. Uh, the whole concept of uh, ludic me uh, metafiction and eco-critical aspects of Final Fantasy uh, seems a lot uh, similar to, uh, as I was uh, uh, talking Hideo Kojima's uh, two games, for example, Metal Gear Solid 2, uh, where it, it, it has an elaborate co commentary on such sequels following formulaic similar story structure. And also it is, uh, and the eco-critical part is present in uh, both uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 and Death Stranding. And uh, to a, a large section, it's a lot similar. The, uh, viewpoints of having an alternative answer to you know, the climate question uh, it's uh, also prevalent there but i was asked i was thinking what would you say about the genre influencing the narrative decisions for the the, the genre of grpg how it might have influenced some aspects of these storytelling portions because rpg and jrpg so to say has uh, had very peculiar uh, specific kinds of uh, features which uh, also ties into the question of uh, predestination and uh, since in rpg characters uh, we embody a character and we take decisions on our own though uh, in JRPG, it's a very lot of different kind of uh, decision making than Western RPGs. So I wanted to ask that, uh, what would you say uh, to how, to what extent or in what aspects does the genre of JRPG uh, influence these aspects of uh, metafiction and uh, metatextual uh, narrative and uh, the ecological portions? Do you want to uh, take lead on that, Ruth? Um, I don't know a whole load about RPGs, but the whole idea of subverting predestination, which is which is quite a big thing in a lot of the JRPGs that I'm a, I'm a aware of, is um, it's it's a bold move. 
I gotta say. And um, but at the same time, I think it kind of at the same time you gotta remember that um, this predestination is presented more as a controlling hold over the players rather than a way for them to self-actualize they it's it these two things are kind of pitted against each other whereas usually within jrpgs um destiny is a way for them to self-actualize who they should become um and so because they've set the two apart it's a little easier to deal with i think but um i feel like i'm speaking a little bit about out of turn because i haven't played that many jrpgs um mostly mostly because i'm i'm very much aware of the um of the time requirements um so i don't know if you have any further comments oh you just dropped out there yeah. uh sorry i was just going to say i don't know if you have any further comments uh i do um so yes thank you for mentioning hideo kojima whose name is, ne is never very far away when you're talking about meta stuff um and i do have a paper that i wrote with um uh brendan keogh and um ben abraham about basically eco criticism and death stranding um that i have no idea when it's coming out because it's in an edited collection so uh could be any time but um yeah that that game is super fascinating and kojima is obviously like comparing metal gear solid 2 and its meta kind of like self-referentiality to Death Stranding is, is pretty fascinating, um, I think. I think to the question about the JRPG specificity is really, really interesting as well. Um, but that would probably require a bit more kind of like grounding in um, specifics of Japanese culture and games industry to, to give like a full accounting of. But what I will say is that um, if we was a ways back, yeah, Square Enix is, is prone to doing this kind of thing. I think it is interesting in some of the examples that we gave, um, studios and developers and even publishers um, need a bit of a track record in doing this to pull it off properly. So Epic with their Apple versus, uh, you know, free Fortnite hashtag thing, they're drawing on a pretty well-established playbook with that. And um, Square Enix seems to be doing so as well. Um, so that's maybe worth thinking about as well, that it's kind of like um, something that takes a bit of a track record to get right. Unless you're Naftali Faulkner and you make um, an amazing game in one year that, that does that. Go, go and play Umaragi Generation, everyone. I can't, I can't stress how good this game is enough. <laughs> Did you have any other questions? Or if you do you have uh, any other questions? Oh, he says thanks for the answer. Uh, the game that's on the screen right now, I mean, it really caught my eye. I'm so, I'm dying to play this game. So I'll buy it soon. Uh, anyway, any other questions do we have from the, from the audience? Um, 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 um. feedback there, Shivik. Yeah, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, perfect. So I was wondering if I could uh, just kind of uh, ask a question. If anyone else uh, wants to go first, please do. Uh, but otherwise, I was just wondering, um, you know, a fascinating talk, both of you. It's like uh, really, really fantastic. I'm, I'm kind of uh, like thinking through this at the moment, but I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, when you used the example of civilization and these kinds of games. Um, does the ludographic ma metafiction um, that is constructed around this game, uh, you know, uh, there are like two parts to this. One is that, uh, you know, uh, my question is about kind of colonialism and eco-criticism, really. Uh, how, how do games which depict kind of uh, issues of empire, colonization, exploitation, uh, kind of link to ecocritical notions, ideas, and then is the meta metafiction that is kind of like uh, built around these. Uh, is it is it kind of uh, hard coded into the algorithm or the thinking of of these games in how these games have been 
thought of conceived in the first place really uh, so one is is do they do they kind of uh, uh, you know connect to kind of uh, issues of colonialism and empire and how and then whether is whether it is kind of directly linked to the you know the very premise and the algorithm of these games so i can um as you, as you may have remembered i had to skip over um civilization so i will quickly yeah. answer that now um i think the ludographic um practice of Firaxis is really interesting because it constrains them in many ways civilization six has to be recognizable as a civilization game so it has to cite certain um, certain rules and uh, structures from the previous games, and that constrains what they can actually do. And their attempts to get across some of the issues that you mentioned across the game series would probably be good for someone to do a proper inventory of, but that would have to be someone who can spend hours upon hours, days upon days playing those freaking games because they take so long to play. Um, but like the idea, for me, the idea that you can have capitalism without necessarily having colonialism and slavery is as fantastic fantastical a proposition as anything we see in final fantasy or umarangi generation it just doesn't make any sense that's not what capitalism is so the way and i think slavery has only appeared as a um, game mechanic in civilization 4. Um, so they're kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the way that they kind of set everything up where this ahistorical world um, kind of, uh, you know, exists, it's kind of like the reasonable centrist's view of history. At, you know, that, that's the most generous you can be. Um, but they kind of need to do that because that's what the game is. So the ludography in that case really constrains what they can do. Whereas uh, through the narrative innovations um, that Square Enix are up to or Kojima, there seems to be a lot more latitude for action. And the other thing is like the Gathering Storm um, supplement for Civilization VI, it really does imagine a technocratic solve for um, climate change. So it brings climate change into the game, but you know, the, the, the things that you can do about it are um, carbon sequestration, sequestration, you know, good management of coastal areas, um, stuff like that. And given the game has no real way of modeling multinational corporations that um, are more, you know, have larger kind of like turnover than entire nations, um, and given, I don't know if anyone saw it, but Channel 4 in the UK did a bit of a sting operation with an ExxonMobil, ExxonMobil um, executive recently where he pretty much admitted he thought he was going for a job interview. He pretty much admitted this is something that we all kind of know, but they have actually been um, uh, kind of actively, um, you know, lobbying and spreading kind of like doubt about climate change, and they know that they're doing it straight up. So you have a game that claims to be about climate change and not include actors like that, to me, seems extremely fantastical. I think like two of the games that we've talked about, Final Fantasy and Umarangi Generation, are far more incisive climate change games, which may be a bit mean. I don't mean to be too mean about Paraxis. They, they've done some like cool stuff. But um, yeah, it's, it, it's got to be fraught if you're going to include those themes because they are difficult topics. Ruth, did you want to say anything about that? Um, about Civ 6 specifically, I mean, I, I mentioned the um, the spiffing Brit who usually does um, loads of, who generally looks at ways you can exploit RTS games and, of course, has done a whole load of stuff on Civ 6 and the, um, and the recent expansion and... Um, the whole it, it ends up being actually if you're talk, thinking about metafiction and meta games around um around games themselves ends up being um quite <laughs> quite an interesting insight into um into colonialism narratives 
um, and perceptions of them um, these days because his whole thing is that, um, oh, I, I am the spiffing Brit. And um, like he, he's, um, he does uh, like a very, very posh British accent. And the whole idea is he's supposed to represent um a particular parody of um of british culture and um it ends up um it ends up giving um some quite interesting um meta narratives around um around colonialism narratives in rts games um and the extent to which games pull this thing directly or not sounds cool i mean that, that would be the other thing for sure which is like fan culture messing with these games, that's maybe where you can find some some really different kind of possibilities or mods and stuff like that. Thank you so much for, for, for that kind of really, really kind of, uh, you know, incisive and, uh, you know, uh, thoughtful answer. So I was just wondering if anyone else uh, would like to ask uh, other I questions. I think Arito made a wonderful point. Uh, in the, in the chat box, he says, reminds this, uh, the, what Ruth was saying, it reminds him of a video by Super Benny Hawk on YouTube about global warming depicted by strategy games. I was just thinking about that. Arthur, do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, Arthur, are you around? I don't know that one, but I would really like a link if anyone has it. I can't see the chat. I can only see my presentation in full screen. Oh, it's okay. I mean, it's okay if you remove your uh, screen. If you, if you switch off your screen sharing thing, I guess. But the chat, you can see there's a small chat, chat icon in the at the bottom of the screen. You can click on that and you can see the chat open up on the left side of the screen. I don't know, chatception. <laughs> I'll throw you back. Can you hear that? Can you talk? Okay. No, I just wanted to uh, point uh, my point out my and uh, say that it reminded me about uh, that video on YouTube I saw uh, about global warming, uh, the concept of global warming depicted by different strategy games and also uh, it's interesting because there are a couple of uh, newer games coming up uh, i saw on the steam indie game uh, forum uh, there was one game i exactly can't remember the name right now but that game uh, was a city building game where essentially you are reversing the whole concept of city building game uh, because you are uh, terraforming as in you are bringing back uh, plant life and you are bringing back greenery by destroying the uh, previous city and the industrial areas. So this is what uh, I saw and there are several uh, like, new aspects of, uh, for example, Banished. There is a game uh, Banished where the there is a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of secondary objective that uh, works as as intent as uh, a mutual uh, sort of uh, objective like where there should be should the player should enter uh, ensure a mutual existence between uh, human life and uh, the nature natural life so these are the la latest strategy game uh, innovations that i'm seeing recently uh, in case yeah. of the, uh, I actually think oh there's been a feedback. Um I actually think I know the one you're talking about, but it's buried in the tabs on this computer that I'm using in my um, browser tabs. Um but another one that's definitely worth checking out is Lycenia uh, by Paolo Pettuccini for a very different sort of city builder. Could you spell it out, Dashina? L I C H E N I A. Based inspired by Octavia Butler. Uh, so very different from from the Firaxis kind of like um, take, I think.
Uh, okay, uh, do we have any other questions or comments? Please unmute yourself and uh, you can talk. I was also thinking uh, on the topic of meta, meta fictional uh, or meta textual uh, portion of the, the gameplay. Uh, I was talking, I was thinking about gameplay aspects of it uh, because uh, many of the games, uh, the gameplay aspect isn't actually uh, taken into consideration and it's sort of uh, the gameplay, the, the sort of gameplay itself being uh, a sort of understanding. Uh, uh, for me, uh, as I like to think of it, that uh, the gameplay terminologies and uh, the terminologies which aren't actually uh, addressed by in-game index, uh, but uh, obviously they are addressed to the game, they, the players themselves. I tend to think that the gameplay uh, is a sort of in the uh, middle space and the gameplay itself is the fourth wall, uh, so to say, but the gameplay uh, I tend to think that it is, uh, it tends to be on the other side of the fourth wall with the player. But I was also thinking about games with, where the gameplay uh, makes itself uh, very pronounced in uh, not just gameplay, also uh, the controller, the what the controls of the games. Uh, obviously, again, going back, if I if we go back to Metal Gear Solid One, or one of the famous examples would be. Psychomantis, uh, the boss fight, uh, actually, uh, the boss fight is unwinnable by uh, uh, keeping the controller plugged in the first port. And you, you have to physically get up and uh, change the controller port. So I was also thinking that about this aspect of gameplay and it being addressed or explained or being acknowledged by the in-game narrative. So <clears throat> I think that's um, that's why that's why I included the example of Epic. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, the the question of interface and Metal Gear Solid and <clears throat> that psychomatist kind of thing. That's all. That's all super awesome. Um, but I do understand a note of caution about the, um, the the kind of like instrumentalization of some of these tendencies. Um, so loot boxes, for example, are, you know, make use of ludographic metafiction that what Epic is trying to do with their metaverse, um, makes use of this to, for the purposes of enclosure and for creating sort of like, um, valorizing, uh, uh, or creating value that, um, is then enclosed, but within the, you know, within the economy of, um, Final Fantasy VII, which Ruth can can probably jump in and on now. Um, I think it works very differently. So we need to like start to maybe categorize what's going on in these different contexts. Um, but maybe that, that's something that we can we can work on going forward. Yeah, I mean it's quite difficult. If um, I'm like I, I was actually going to start thinking a little bit wider than this. Um, several attempts to um, to bring eco-critical issues into um, into game stuff, into gameplay itself, um, have been quite hardware heavy. So I'm kind of thinking of things like um, Boktai, The Sun Is In Your Hand, um, which was that Game Boy Advance game where you had to um, like charge up the car the cartridge with like this mini solar panel so that your light gun would work. Um, and if Wasn't you that it? Wasn't that a Kojima game as well? It was Konami. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I it was. I know it was Konami. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, otherwise, yeah. So if you didn't, if you didn't charge up your cartridge, then you know you couldn't kill vampires, um, which is very cool, but not really something you can afford to do with um, with every single game. And um, yeah, maybe live in you know, yeah, well, yes, yeah, very difficult if you live in Scotland. I mean, it's got the kind of peripheral issue, right? Which is like, um, like they had with Rock Band, where like a large proportion of like the money they were making off those games came from the peripherals, and then when people weren't buying the peripherals anymore, the whole thing collapsed. But, um, but anyway, when it comes to actual gameplay, I mean, it's easier to do the 
um, metafictional part as pure metafiction, you know, like, um, so for example, having Aerith talking to um, the player during fights than it is to modify the actual gameplay. I mean, let's, uh, we've already talked about Kojima, let's talk about Death Stranding. So, um, so Death Stranding kind of messes with that by having a game where it's not a case of you going out shooting and defeating and killing things you're um you're connecting up different people across the place you're carrying parcels you're forging bridges you're building things rather than destroying things and um the problem is that because that's not something that gamers are are necessarily used to doing in certainly in a triple a game there was a very mixed reaction to it now a lot of people who stuck with it towards the end and kind of uncovered the main thematic metafictional resonances of that were rewarded but a lot of people just didn't have the patience for it and that's the difficulty of um of bringing in um games where into triple a games in particular this kind of mechanic of of living in harmony with the gaming environment because um, as, as Kojima himself has put it, the usual way we interact with the environment is by using sticks um, to kind of beat it down as opposed to ropes to connect us. And, um, you know, it's those kind of games are still con considered niche if they're considered games at all. And, Kojima can get away with that because he's an auteur, but everything else that kind of deals with that kind of thing, you know, as you're all, as um, Eritro is aware, it's, they're indie games, they're, they're games that aren't considered mainstream. And um, it, it, you know, then we start getting into our whole perception of what a game is and all of this kind of thing. But yeah, it's it's harder to kind of do the game mechanic thing when it comes to themes like this because it means completely revising our entire perception of what a game narrative can and should be. Ruth, do you realize you just added platform studies to the list of stuff that I have to like <laughs> do it now? Jeez. No. <laughs> no sleep till Christmas. No sleep till Christmas. What are you doing? It's the worst. <clears throat> Fascinating, man. Fascinating. Uh, all right, do we, do we have any questions from the audience? Or should we wrap up the wrap up the talk? Shorita, do you want to uh, do you want to add anything? Um, no, thanks. that was a really, really fascinating presentation and uh, a much long awaited one. Uh, so thank you again, Darshana and Ruth uh, for for making the time and for for kind of treating us to this fascinating presentation. So uh, I know that I made this announcement uh, last time, uh, but we are on the way to becoming a DIGRA chapter here in India. So we now have our website ready, digraindia.com. Uh, not kind of just made it, uh, you know, like live, live. It's 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 up there. You could go and look at it. But uh, we've not kind of yet started the drum rolls uh, until we speak to, you know, until kind of Digra makes the official announcement. So yeah, well, so uh, this is actually a momentous occasion for us to make this announcement, and what a fantastic talk to kind of you know use as an opportunity for uh, you know as a launching pad for Degra India. So thank you all for for kind of uh, joining us, uh, many of you from different parts of the world, and uh, yes, and thanks to all my fantastic colleagues, and uh, of course, of course, thanks to uh, Darshana and. Uh, Ruth, uh, for for kind of making this such a you know wonderful evening. So I think uh, we can now okay. say yeah, you can stop the recording. Yeah, uh, stop the recording. Then. Yeah. Okay.